Hello, so a bit of a strange one today. And the reason for that is that all of the groundwork for this has pretty much already been done there. If I were to do this as a step by step, it would just be a lot of refactoring. So I figured it would just be better to explain this one verbally, sort of a, a walk and talk. Um, what I'm doing in this stage, in this tutorial, in this video, is I'm taking all of that work that I did on the CPU and I'm now doing it on the GPU, the work of first up updating the objects so they spin around and secondly, determining which objects are visible. The benefit of doing it on the GPU is I'm executing this as a compute shader, as a parallel task, which means I can do it very, very quickly. So I'll sort of step from top to bottom. So first up, this is my game object. And as you can see, we're pretty much packing in as much as we can, <clears throat> but every single object in the world is represented as we can say, like a position, an angle, and some code which indicates what sort of object it is. In addition to that, every object type, every different type of model has its own bounding box, which has been queried ahead of time and can be represented on the GPU. The job itself is a one dimensional job. We just need the index I of the current object that we're looking at, which is why we're setting the work group size as such. In terms of the resources that I'm working with, well, we need to know the frame time because we need to um, spin the objects around. And we also need to know the max object count because right now we'll just be throwing a whole bunch of stuff at the GPU and it's unsized. The GPU doesn't know how many objects there are. So that's useful. If you look down at the main function, we can get our index i and then exit if we're beyond the object count. But we've um, got a bunch of other things as well. So we've got a buffer of all of those game objects. This is like the soup that we're throwing at the GPU for every frame. And then we've also got a uniform buffer, basically, which stores the camera. And we probably, we probably don't need to do it with view projection and view proj. View proj is the only matrix we're using, but this is how it is. Um, and then we've also got this buffer of matrix fours into which we're going to write the transformation for any visible objects. So objects get updated no matter what, but if an object is visible, then additionally, its model transform will be written to this buffer so that the shader can later read that back and say, okay, this is how we're going to place the object in the world. Now I'm doing a bit of a funky thing here. So I've got 14 object types and every draw command has five integers. Now, as I write this out, as I explain this, I realize that there probably are more compact ways of doing this, but 70 atomic integers, even though not all of them are being used as atomic integers, it's a solution. It's probably not the worst, but yeah. So I'm just representing everything as like a whole big set. And we can pick this out as like every five integers represent one draw command. Um, but then, yeah, we've also got the bounding boxes. So if we look in here, um, I've made a few functions to generate matrices for various transformations. And if we go down, yeah, let's look at the main function. So first up, we get our index I indicating which object from the object soup we're going to look at and we bounce check it. Then, like I said, every object gets updated no matter what. This saves us from having to do a round trip to the CPU. So what we could do is we could have the objects on the CPU doing their update as normal and then throwing that data over to the GPU every frame. But by doing everything on the GPU, we avoid having to throw stuff over. But yeah, then we calculate the transformation of the current object that we're looking at. And we throw all that info into our visibility test. We're saying, hey, I've got an object of this type. This is, this is its transformation. 
is that thing visible? Now the transformation, uh, sorry, the visibility check is pretty much doing the same as, oops, as I was doing in previous videos. We get the bounding box as a cube. Then we apply the view projection transform to that bounding box and then recompute a new bounding box encompassing that transformed box. It works basically. And then we just do the standard screen space or clip space test. So in the case that we're not visible, we just return, we're done. In the case where we are visible, we need to do two things. We need to increment the instance count for this specific draw command, the draw command corresponding to this object type. But then we need to write in the model transformation. So I'll just sort of, just for reference, I'll just sort of write this out. So we have our index count. There we go. This is a set of five integers representing a draw command. So what we do is we want to get an offset into the model buffer and every, uh, like I've said, I'm not sure if I said this clearly, but um, every different object type has some sub region reserved within that buffer, no matter what. And this is based on the number of instances of each object type. So up front, when we create everything, we count up how many of each object type do we have, we allocate space for that. And even if all of the models are visible, if none of the models are visible, that space is still there and that offset is still valid. So all I'm doing here is I'm just querying, I'll go zero, one, two, three, four. I'm just querying the base instance and that will give me my offset. That's what this atomic counter operation is doing is fetching the value of the counter. But then this next bit here, atomic counter increment will increment whatever this atomic counter is and return the value prior to incrementing. So if we look in zero one, that's the instance count. So this is marking the instance count up by one and getting that little semi, that, that sub offset within the object type partition. I hope that makes sense. Sometimes I wonder whether the stuff I'm saying makes sense, but long story short, it's starting to fill up that region for that specific object type. You know, this is the monster object. Three of them are visible. Okay, we can see those model transforms coming in. Um, and that's what we're doing here. So we got that right position. We store that in there. Yeah. Okay. So on the shader side, like vertex and all of that, not much really changes. We can pretty much you know, with a piece of paper, um, you can work out what the memory layout is and set things up so that you don't need to rebind resources. Let's make sure we're using the same stuff. Um, but yeah, so, okay. Now, if I'm remem remembering correctly, this uh, GL instance ID for some reason will always start from zero, which is why I'm offsetting it by base instance. And that's making sure that um, we are fetching the correct model transform. But yeah, I mean, not much more to say here. Let's just have a look at it and see how it runs. So I forget, were we doing 60 frames per second before? I don't know. Okay, well, we're now doing 160 frames per second or so. That's pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. So yeah, that's a win. Now, I realize that this video has been a little light on coding. So I'll throw something else in for fun. And that is I went back and I took this and I said, okay, well, is it possible to do any pre-processing on the CPU before throwing this scene over? Like right now we're doing a whole big object soup and that's fine. But is there some way we can do it like a broadsheet, like vaguely work out which things are probably visible before throwing them at the compute shader. Um, and I did this using bounding volume hierarchies. So yeah, I also had a look at using um, task flow to try to parallelize some of it 
but it just it didn't work that well but SIMD worked pretty well um, so yeah um, super briefly this is the same thing using a bounding volume hierarchy okay so it's not super noticeable and a lot of this could come down to the random number generation but yeah so as you can see conclusion it's the same maybe a little better I don't know that could just be me imagining that it's running better because I know what it's doing but this will probably be it for the time being for the rendering stuff now we could take things a little further with occlusion culling so if we look at this you know this object here it's sort of blocking a few other objects we could put in some tests to um, cull further but the reason I'm going to leave this is that I think the most effective occlusion culling is not having a fully open world restricting the world and in that sense the occlusion culling can be done much more efficiently by having a geometric structure that encompasses this stuff I hope that makes sense and what I'm getting at is for this series I'm going to leave the uh, the big scene rendering for the time being and I'm going to have a look at some other stuff let me know actually let me know down below now that we've closed the book on big scene rendering what would you like to see I want to know but anyway you know Merry Christmas um, hope things are going well and I will see you again soon bye